I'd like to call to order the meeting of the Niles Main District Library Board of Trustees. Uh, may I have a roll call, Diane? Uh, Karen? Here. Carolyn? Here. Becky? Here. Diane? Oh, Diane, unmute. Okay. <laughs> uh, Umar? Umir? Is he here? I don't think no. he is here okay. yet. Uh, Patty? He here. And Linda? Yes. All right, if you would keep an eye out for him to see if he joins us and note that, note that in the minutes. Okay. So the first thing that uh, we are pleased to have this evening is a guest to join us, uh, Ms. Prisha Modi, who, is the, who was the library president for the day. And as such, um, she is awarded a key to the library. And I think she's joined us now as a guest here. Uh, Prisha, ah, yes, there we can see you. Uh, welcome. Uh, we're delighted to have you uh, joining our meeting today. And um, I would just like to uh, say a couple of words uh, about Prisha. Um, I understand that uh, she is a Nelson student, a uh, fifth grader from Nelson. My daughter went to Nelson School, so I am very fond of Nelson School. Um, Diane Olson, I guess you were one of the judges, is that correct? Yes, it is. Um, she wonder, uh, wrote a wonderful introduction to herself and why she wanted to become the president for the day. Okay. Um, I understand this is the second time we've done the contest, and this year there are about 50 children who wow. made a submission. So I think that's really good large yeah. number of uh, students who submitted for this uh, uh, contest. And Prisha, you should be very proud. Um, so what I'd like you to do, Prisha, if you're willing to do so, is to read your submission for us so that, that we all can hear it. Would you mind doing that? All right, Prisha, now I can't hear you quite yet. Um, can you hear me now? Uh, yes, we can. I can. Thank you. Thank you. Why don't you go right ahead? Okay. Hello, everyone. My name is Prisha. You should choose me to be library president because my favorite thing to do is read. And I have a lot of knowledge about the library. When I borrow books, music, and movies, I learn something new. And it's because the library provides all these amazing facilities, and it helps me learn many different things. When I read the books, they help me express my thoughts. I can identify what is happening ever since I've started reading. I have done many things in the library. For example, the Reading Patch Club, Battle of, Battle of Books, we won also last year, 3D printing, Reading with the Rover, and lots of other programs. There are many different types of devices to help you. You can use the computer, 3D printer, a copier, and a printer, but there are also devices to help you learn, play, and have a good time. It's like the library is my and my and the book's home. My sister and I are and have learned many things. We are so lucky to have such an amazing library with awesome librarians helping us so much and helping us find books and do programs. That's why you should choose me for library president for the day. Very good. Thank you well very done. much. <laughs> well, I think the Good judges job, made, made an excellent choice. I can see why they chose you for president of the day. And when you uh, get to be a little older, perhaps you'd like to run for the library board and become the actual president for every day of the year, except for one day when a student gets to be it instead. So keep that in mind for a future goal of yours, perhaps. Uh, Prisha, thanks very much for joining us. Now, do I understand that you, did you get a plaque of some sort, too? Yes. Oh, can we see it? Oh, Ooh. I love that key. Oh, very nice. That's, that's great. Very nice. Very oh. nice. Well, I hope that'll go somewhere in your room, perhaps. Yes. Oh. Right. I'm jealous. Congratulations. <laughs> Yeah, I'm jealous. We we actual presents don't actually get a key, so you're you're really very lucky. 
<laughs> okay, all right, I think we need to move along. Thank you very much. You're welcome to stay at the meeting or enjoy your evening doing something else. It's up to you, Prisha. Um, but we will move on to our next uh, item on the agenda. Mary, I want to welcome you uh, to the meeting too. I'm uh, glad you could join us. Thank um, you. Sorry, sorry about the delay. I've been having uh, internet issues. So if I happen to go in and out, then that, that, that'll explain that. Yeah, I, we all understand how that happens. Um, the only thing we've done so far today is uh, uh, meet our president for the day, Prisha Modi. So the next item on the agenda welcome, is uh, something that we have on our agenda every November. Every November, we invite our auditors to give us a report. They spend, uh, I don't know, a, a month or so on and off at the library before uh, our coming to our November meeting. Um, in our packet, we have a report from them. And we have a gentleman, Mr. Michael Devale from Lauterbach and Amon, who um, I believe will, joining us, will join us tonight. Susan, is he in the waiting room? Yes, he is. He's coming in. Um, I should mention, uh, and I have to apologize for this, I forgot to put on the Pledge of Allegiance on the agenda. Oh, so we have missed uh, well, all right. Why don't we do that right now? I should have remembered that myself. Why don't we uh, stand now for the Pledge of Allegiance? Okay. All right. Pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, America and to and the republic for which it stands, and one nation, nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, everyone. Um, and sorry about that omission, but we'll continue on now. All right, uh, Mr. Devali, are you um, able to hear us? Hello, yes, hi everybody. Hi, how are you? Hi. I'm Hello. well, thank you. Good, good. Um, so Mr. Devali, you are um, one of our auditors from the firm of Lauterbeck and Ammon. And just for our new board members, your firm has done this, is, it, is this your second or third year doing it for This our, was our second year audit with the- Second with, year. So. Okay, all right. And we had been having an audit every year, but just by, by another firm. Uh, but um, Butterbell and Audit has done it now for a couple of years. And, and we, we would like you to uh, briefly go over the report uh, that yeah. we have received in our packet. So we do have uh, the report itself. And if you just sort of want to walk us through it uh, quickly, I would like to give the board members an opportunity to ask Mr. Giovanni any questions after he's given his short presentation. Wonderful. So, um, yeah. So again, thank you for the introduction, Karen. So, so as our second year audit with the Niles Main Library, um, you know, I've been with Lauterbach and Naming for a while. I do about 30 different libraries in the area every year. So pretty involved in the libraries. So um, we're going to start with the smaller of the two packets you would have received the management letter comments first. Then we'll move to the main audit report. Um, feel free to ask questions, you know, as I go through. I'll open it up for questions after the presentation as well. And of course, after tonight, if the board has any additional questions or you're reviewing the audit, um, you know, please feel free to go through Susan or Greg for any questions. So, um, and thank you for uh, letting me go after that bright young lady who got to be president for a day. I see she didn't want to stick around for the audit. I can't blame her. <laughs> <laughs> so we, will, we won't make her go through that yet. So, <laughs> and actually, um, I've actually been on the screen to go through this. Would you guys like me to do that as well? Um, sure. For sure. Yeah. Is that better? Okay. Okay. Oh, I have disabled yeah. share screen currently. Now go ahead. Okay. There we go. Okay, so again, we are gonna start with the smaller of the packets. So this is the management letter comments. Management letter comments, we like to say, are recommendations to the board and to the client. These don't have to be posted online. They're not for the public. They're simply recommendations that we give to clients. Okay. So starting off on the, the page here, um, I do wanna mm -hmm. first of all say that this year, the library basically received no comments at all. The only recommendations on here are comments from the prior year audit that had been implemented in the year 
and this year they're still on here basically saying they were issued last year this year they've been implemented and will fall off of next year um the reason i emphasize that is it's a really big deal for clients to have zero recommendations for an audit um so you know last year was our first year so we issued the three recommendations that we'll look at in a moment and it's, it's truly a testament to the board, to the management at the library to have all of these implemented within the year. It's very uncommon, never happens where a client takes the time to take our recommendations seriously. So I, I do want to emphasize that as well. So the first one was our fund balance policy that the board knows we implemented early in the fiscal year. Capital asset policy, again, was issued last year and has been implemented. And then the last but not least was an outstanding check write-off policy. So again, at the bottom of each one, you'll see the verbiage. This comment has been implemented. It will not be repeated in the future. So I'm going to go ahead and move on to the audit report itself. Um, as I go through this, I'm going to be... The only downfall to sharing a screen is as I flip through the pages. So if you're a, a motion sick person like me, you might want to just close your eyes till you hit <laughs> page. So, um, so again, I'm going to try and stick to a relatively higher level overview. Obviously, you guys as the board um, know that with the caveat being COVID, we didn't have a whole lot of extraordinary activity outside our general scope of operations. You know, of course, the caveat that being COVID. So past the table of contents in the audit report, we get to the audit, independent auditor's report. So this is basically an auditor's letter stating that the audit has been completed and we've issued what we consider an unmodified audit opinion, which is the highest level of opinion that we can issue for an audit. Following the auditor's report, we get to the MDNA section, management discussion and analysis. We're not going to go through this in detail, but we like to tell clients, board members, citizens, anyone who will listen to us, if you're going to take time to look at any part of the audit, the MDNA section is a great place to do that. It's a high level executive overview of the fiscal year for the library without the formality of just regular basic financial statements. So again, if you're going to take time to look at any part of the audit, we suggest the MDNA section is a good place to do that. Following the MDNA section, we get to our basic financial statements. And we are actually going to start off on page 14. So, page 14 is our balance sheet for our governmental funds. So, we have general, our capital projects, our special reserve fund, and our non major funds, which we'll see later on in the audit. That's our audit, liability insurance, audit, those smaller funds. So this page here we see is the balance sheet for the governmental funds. So we have assets, liabilities, down to our fund balances at the bottom here. Now I'm actually going to skim over to page 16, which is my favorite page of the audit, because this is our revenue, expenditures, and change in fund balance for the year. So here we have funds, general, special reserve, non-majors. And the third line from the bottom, we can see the net changing balances in our individual funds. So here we can see the general fund had a decrease of the 2.275. Special reserve had an increase of the 2.7. And our non-majors as a whole had an increase of about $90,000. And we can see here that the library chose to transfer $3 million from our general fund to our special reserve fund. And which is great because I know there's been a lot of emphasis in trying not to overinflate or grow our general fund fund balance. And so this was a great move by the library to transfer out from general to a special reserve fund and start to show that capital projects fund being increased as opposed to continuing to increase our general fund. Following the basic financial statements, we get to the notes to the financial statements. Without getting into too much detail on the, <laughs> to the financial statements, um, basically in the government world of audit standards, certain information that's not required to be in the formal financial statements 
is where you'll see it listed out in the notes to the financial statements. Accounting policies, practices, certain items such as long-term liabilities, capital assets, things of that nature not required to be in the financial statements as we saw above. The notes to the financial statements are where we are going to see that information. So again, I'm not going to cover these in detail, um, just letting you know that that's what this information essentially represents. And again, I'm going to try not to make it too hard on the motion sick people. So skimming all the way down to page 47, we get to our non-major governmental funds that we saw totaled up above. So here on page 47, we have again, the balance sheet for our non-majors. So we have the assets, liabilities, fund balance. The first page, we have our audit, liability, insurance fund. The following page, we have social, workers' compensation, unemployment compensation, and our building and site funds. Again, assets and liabilities. And then moving to my favorite page again, we have the same non-major governmental funds, but this is our revenue expenses and change in fund balance for these funds. So again, the third line from the bottom, we can see our audit fund had an increase of almost 7,000. Liability insurance fund had a decrease of the 33,000. And we'll circle back to this in just a moment. Social security decrease, workers comp decrease, unemployment increase, building and site overall increase. Um, and I know the library and the board does a great job of being conscious of our ending fund balances, specifically in these special revenue funds, these non-major governmental funds. So when we see a significant decrease like this in our liability insurance fund, it's not because we just didn't allocate taxes properly for this specifically. The library is making a conscious effort that we have a high fund balance in this account and we're making an effort to spend that down to bring the ending fund balance more in line with our actual expenses are. And the reason I'm pointing that out is because you guys specifically as a board and as you know the business manager, the director making these decisions, you guys are doing exactly what we would like to see libraries in this situation do. We do have a handful of library clients that we see their non-major funds incurring these significant ending fund balances that are two, three, four years worth of what one year of expenses would be. So to see clients taking action to spend some of those fund balances down and reduce the amount of taxes we're putting into those for a couple of years is exactly the action that is perfect for um, the situation here. So liability insurance fund, I think is a good example of that. So that's the only reason I'm touching base on that specifically. Okay, so following the change in fund balance for our non-major governmental funds, after these, we kind of get into the details with comparing budget to actuals. Again, not gonna cover these in detail, but it's the same non same non-majors we just saw above. And that is actually all I have for the brief presentation on the audit there. Okay, thank Any you, Mr. Questions Wally. or comments? Yeah. Um, yeah, I have a, a comment first right off the bat and I, I want to uh, thank and commend our director, Susan Lemke and business manager, Greg Pritz for implementing the recommendations that were made last year and enabling us to have really a, a clean audit report this year. So I want to thank you two for um, looking at those recommendations and, and uh, taking care of those matters this past year. So um, I will um, go around the room now and or look around the screen here. And uh, would you like, uh, perhaps I'll just leave the report up in case there are some questions about it. Or ask and sorry, questions. again, really quick before we jump into questions, I do, kind of want to piggyback on what Karen said. And, you know, obviously implementing the recommendations is a big deal, but it, it's great going to a client and, you know, between Susan, Greg, the other um, person in the business department, Lissy or Lisi, I always get it wrong, I know. Um, it's just such a great staff up there. And the everything we request is very clean. Um, it's just always a very straightforward audit. So last year was our first audit, quite a bit more work involved. But the second year audit just went so smooth. 
working around everybody's schedules, make sure we're being safe during the requests, all the emails. It was really just a, a smooth audit, all things considered in this, you know, crazy world we're working in. So, well, I'll throw that out there. Okay, thank you. Um, does anyone have any questions or comments about the audit? If you want to just raise your hand, I'll look and see if I see any hands raised. And again, after tonight, we'll have, okay. um, if you guys have questions. All right, I, I, I'm not sure who came first, but I'm going to call on you, Diane, and then Carolyn, I'll get to you right after that. Diane, but you have to unmute yourself. Yes, uh, thank you. There is one more report here, and I don't think it has a title, but it does bring up some findings. What, can you explain what that's all about? Which page are you talking you? about, Diane? I'm not sure I know what you're uh, talking about. It doesn't have page numbers. Where did I get this? It's a letter. Yeah. Um, the significant audit findings. Disagreements with management, other audit findings, other matters. Dated October 19, 2020. I think what you're looking at is just a, a standard a audit letter. Oh yeah. This yeah, like I don't think that's that's letter. that's not anything specifically addressed to the Niles Library. That's just a standard audit oh. letter. Oh. Okay. All right. Thank you for clearing that up. Yeah. Thanks for the easy question to start. <laughs> okay. Diane, was that it? Yes, I just didn't understand that. All right, uh, Carolyn, you had your hand up. Carolyn, are you still there? Oh, she looks frozen. I'm having trouble with my internet. Okay. Um, I, I'm not sure what to say. Do you want to call in or? Um, when we have a hand raised from Linda Ryan. Linda, why don't you go ahead while we're waiting? Okay, I just want to make a comment. Um, I just want to um, say that I'm very humbled and honored to be part of such a responsible staff and board to oversee our budget and to have such a pristine report. I just want to say thank you so much for all your hard work and dedication to everyone. Yeah, yeah. thank you. Really, really, really. Yeah. Yeah. Like, I'm, I'm really, my heart is warm. It's really nice to hear a report like this. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. yeah. And don't get me wrong, we're not shy about issuing recommendations. So I don't want you to think we're skimming on anything here. Um, <laughs> we, uh, I mean, if there's anywhere, if anyone's going to give constructive criticism or recommendations, you know, that's the auditor's job. So to have none issued this year is, uh, yeah, great. Well, you gave it's us some really, last year, so that's great. Yeah, it's just really a nice validation of what I already knew, but it's, um, you know, from a, you know, from your um, accounting firm is is just really, just, I feel very blessed to be on this board. Thank you. Thank you. It's okay. nice to hear as someone new coming in as well that compared to other libraries yeah. in the area that we're doing really well, so I appreciate hearing that. So um, I do not see Carolyn. Um, yeah, she's in now. She just has to unmute. Now. I, I still don't see her. Do you? I see her. She's oh, just... there she is. OK, Carolyn. She's at the end, I don't see a visual, though. I see, uh, see you visually, you Carolyn. And yes. Yeah. Can you hear me? Okay, here's what I did. I have my phone on and my computer, so if I lose one, maybe I'll still be on the other. So I hope it's not distracting, but can you hear me talk? Yeah. Okay, I had just a three questions. Um, my first one was regarding IMRS, and it's on page 40. 
Okay. Okay, and I wait, let me just go back to make okay. sure I understand this. Okay, so the terminology is um, our plan is as of December 31st, our measurement date is December 31st, 2019, which means IMRF is like calendar year, correct? Correct. So IMRF, whenever they run their reports, it's always as of December 31st at the end of the year. Um, oh. And so that, that does have, you know, depending on how the, the finance was going, the economics at the time. Um, but that, correct, that is when IMRF runs the reports as of. Okay. So my question was, by any chance, since it's November and um, we're already, we'll be ending again in one month, do you have any information for us or any highlights about where we're headed in terms of what our contribution issue rates may be because of the, the you know, we've had a horrible year. So I'm wondering if, if you, do you have any information about that or is it too early? Um, like are there any? The, the short answer is it's, it's definitely too early at this point. Um, you know, frankly, with, First and foremost, IMRF is one of the best, if not the best, retirement plans in the United States. Obviously, we're next door neighbors to Chicago, which is a different story. Um, so I'll start with that. IMRF is just a strong plan as a whole. And obviously, we can see in prior years, we were making additional contributions, catching up. So IMRF is in a, in a wonderful position with IMRF. As far as knowing anything for this coming December, again, IMRF runs all their numbers as of December 31st at the end of each year. Between politics, COVID, everything going on right now, the, I mean, look at the stock market, look at all the finances in the world, and the day that someone hits a button in IMRF, depending on how the market is at that time, is going to influence a lot of, you know, information. I have a, okay. a couple, I have a couple of comments that might shed some light on it, Carolyn. Um, I think. As of September 30th, uh, the IMRF uh, investment fund has earned uh, somewhere in the neighborhood of three and a half percent, which is a little bit less than half of their target. Their target is seven and a quarter percent. So that does not include any activity uh, in October and the uh, 18 days of uh, November. And of course it doesn't include, you know, the end of the year uh, either. Um, I will tell you that um, all of the um, indices, um, you know, the S&P 500, uh, the Dow uh, and NASDAQ are, um, uh, are at uh, new record highs. So, um, you know, so that, you know, that may give you some okay. comfort. Uh, should, they okay. make, should they make their number <clears throat> of seven and a quarter percent for the year, uh, obviously, um, you know, it'll, it'll be favorable to our uh, contribution rate. Uh, if they stay at, okay. you know, at about three and a half percent, which is about where they are right now, um, it'll, um, uh, it'll uh, likely go up. Okay. Um, the other the other thing I want to mention is you can go to imrf.org at any time, and uh, if you click on the investments link, you link you can find the performance report for the most recent performance uh, data uh, that's oh. out there. Okay. Thank you for that. Okay. Great. All right. And then I just had a um, couple of questions about that management letter. Um, okay. I know last year we talked about um the outstanding check write-off policy which um uh, greg created and we paid our our debt to the state of illinois and what i'm wondering is i read that this is a process that takes place every three years so within those three years have we created some sort of procedures to identify these checks maybe before it's time to give the state any more money. I, I'm just wondering how will we be handling this now that we're caught up? So let me um, let me uh, give you uh, some information on that. Um, okay, every, 
uh, every month when we look at the uh, reconciliation, uh, we look at the oldest checks. And then um, Lisi Strickling, uh, who works as the uh, business coordinator uh, in the office, will take uh, those checks as I identify them and start to follow up. And what follow up okay. looks what follow up looks like is that she'll uh, try to call the people, uh, the payees on the checks. Uh, she'll also try to send a letter. And after a number of attempts, if she can't uh, resolve it um, one way or the other, then we'll send it to the state. Uh, we did send a small amount earlier this year to the state. I, I don't have that number of it. I think it was less than $500. Okay, well, that's good for now. And I can just make one small comment on that as well, um, especially for some of the newer board members. The comment we issued for outstanding check write-off policy, this is one that we had not been giving to clients in the past. Last year, we started giving it to all clients that did not have a check write-off policy, regardless of if they were in a position we thought they needed to or not. And what I mean by that is, we had clients that had checks in the tens of thousands of dollars that were multiple years old. And across the state, a lot of companies and municipalities were seeing significant amount of checks not being cashed and sitting on these clients' books for years and years and not being addressed properly. So basically a couple of bad apples ruined it for everybody. So everyone else got these check write-off policies. As Greg mentioned, a very small amount you guys had sent. During our audit, you guys are absolutely not a library that we would consider at risk or, or not following up on these properly. Again, this was only given last year because it was kind of across the board issue to all of our clients. In this case, it was not issued because we thought there was a large amount of outstanding old checks at the library. So Greg's explanation of the procedure is spot on. I did just want to have that caveat, caveat that you guys are nowhere near the position that it was going to be, you know, something that we looked into more. So, Right. Absolutely. I agree. Um, and then I had my last question. It's regarding the capital asset policy, which I know I've been hammering all year. So uh, we are now, um, we have now implemented this. So I'm just trying to get a, um, an idea of what, in fact, we implemented. A written policy for capital assets. Have we um, also performed inventory and tagging? I, I'm not familiar with where we are. because I know I've been asking about this. So if somebody could um, fill me in. Did I see that policy up on the screen there for a second? I was just looking at our internal. Memo. Yeah. So um, this is Greg's probably better suited to answer the question, but from from the audit perspective, and I want to make sure we're separating two things here: inventory and capital assets in regards for an audit. Libraries that have an inventory is very specific to them whether they choose to pursue that or not. Typically, we'll see it. IT department who does inventory and keep track of all the small laptops, all the electronics, the monitors, TVs, et cetera. Whereas from an audit perspective and a governmental capital asset perspective that we issued this policy recommendation for, this recommendation and policy that's been implemented is very high level saying major significant purchases for the library typically in the ballpark of um, 2,500 and above are what we are going to recognize in a specific way based on the policy we implemented. And so again, this policy recommendation was issued because it's one of our black and white recommendations if one's not in place. The library has already been doing a great job keeping track of significant purchases that would be on a capital asset listing. Um, so although a policy wasn't in place, we feel that the library still did a really great job of being consistent and having regular practices as they were recognizing capital assets. So when it comes to inventory, that's definitely something for you guys to talk about. 
but in regards to the audit, it's not really relevant or in the same kind of ballpark as the capital asset policy that we're talking about for the audit's purposes. So I hope I didn't make that more confusing than I needed to, but I just want to make sure we're separate inventory and capital asset listing uh, for the audit purposes as a whole. Okay, right. So Mike, so then I think what you're saying is um, we have decided on a policy which indicates capital assets listing would just include items over $2,500. So that's the policy we've implemented, correct? Is yeah, that more saying? or less. There's other caveats okay. in that as well. But, and again, this has basically already been being followed and in practice, we just gave the recommendation because it wasn't formally written down. You know, so there was, there was always a, a well-maintained list taking place and standard practices being followed consistently. That's an important word. Um, so this was really just a formality saying, hey, if Greg wins the lottery next year and he's not here, who's going to be able to read a piece of paper to know how to follow his footsteps kind of deal? Right, right. Okay, so now back to inventory, because that, I believe, is more in line with stewardship. Um, do you have an opinion of what should be inventoried and what shouldn't? Or is that I'm totally not touching that with a 10-foot pole. <laughs> That's really your guys' call. Um, it, it's honestly a resources, and it's a, it's a management and board decision. I, from my experience auditing 30 libraries a year, it's less than three or four that I see maintain actual inventory listings. Capital asset listings, absolutely. Um, I've seen clients have asset tags on staplers and I want to pull my hair out. Oh, um, so oh God. <laughs> um, I'm going to leave it at that. It's really a management and board decision. Um, but it is not something I see common practice with a lot of the libraries I work with. And I'll leave it at that. Okay. Well, thanks for that explanation. I appreciate it. All right, Mr. Devali, uh, just following up on something that Carolyn was talking about, you were mentioning, or I think we all were talking about the uh, uncashed check, check policy. Now, these are the types of assets that end up on the treasurer's, the treasurer of Illinois' cash dash program. Is that right? Where people can find yeah. that, uh, That's exactly right. Yeah. If they have yeah. any money coming to them. So, I don't know. Maybe we'll have something on there. I don't remember if we even had any. But in any event, uh, before we move on, I'd like to know if any of the board members have any further questions or any questions at all regarding um, the presentation that we've just heard. Um, I don't see, oh, there was a hand from Linda Ryan. Yes, yeah. Linda. Um, I'm not actually sure if this is a valid question to ask at this time. I'm not sure if it's more of a Greg question or an auditor's question. However, um, uh, community members have voiced their concerns with me um, about having enough money um, in the special reserve for future renovations and upkeeps of the library. And um, with the money that you've seen, we, I know we had put money into our special reserve. Um, I don't know if you can make a comment on that. Does it look like compared to other, how it looks com like compared to other libraries? Are we in a good place? Um, with our general fund compared to our special reserve, do you think that we still have room to move more money over to um, ensure that we have money in the future for um, for future you know projects? Um, just thought I would get your input on that. Yeah, I'm I'm going to give you my short auditor answer, and then I'll kind of let Greg elaborate more on that. From an auditor perspective, what we're looking right where my eyes go and where my partner's eyes go is let's see the fund ending fund balance compared to the expenses. Okay. So we typically see clients trying to maintain somewhere in the ballpark of three to six months of annual operating expenses. So if every year we spend 5 million bucks in expenses, let's try to shoot for, you know, 2 million, two and a half million in the fund balance and that's a relatively lower to healthy fund balance. You guys clearly are well above and beyond, you know, a, a year's worth of annual expenses, which is why we now have the capital reserve to start funneling some of those increases and in additional funds into. 
Um, now, when you say, does it look like it's enough for a renovation, this or that, I'll tell you right now, there's libraries that have a quarter of what you guys have in your general fund, no special reserves, and their library is 20. So that's a very relative question or kind of you know, how to go with it. Um, not having debt, not having, you know, having a healthy fund balance, general fund, starting to build our special reserve fund, taking my auditor's hat off. It's very healthy, our general fund, and it's very great that we're starting a special reserve to begin increasing that. Above and beyond that is totally up to the, the board. Citizens all have their own opinion on things, um, but it's all, I, I think it looks great. Okay, thank you so much for your input. Yeah. All right, are there any other questions or comments relating to the report from our auditors? I'm not seeing any. So um, I don't think we need to approve it. I think we, we just receive it. Um, so I want to thank uh, Mr. Diwali very much uh, for the presentation this evening and for answering all the questions that we had. Um, so uh, you too are welcome to stay for the rest of our meeting if you'd like to do so. But I appreciate it, but I think I'm going to go walk the dog. Okay. That's, that's well, fine. thank you guys all thank so you. much. Have a thank great you. holiday. Thank you. And I'll see you next year. Thanks for thank joining you. us. Thank you, Michael. Bye. Bye bye. All right. Okay. All right. Um, I think what we'll do now on our agenda, I see approval of the minutes. So, just to work through each one of these, first of all, I'd like the motion to approve the minutes of the virtual special board meeting of October 15th. 2020. Do I have such a motion? Yes. Yes. Patty, and a second? Second. All right. Any questions or comments about the October 15th minutes? I got to find a verse. <laughs> okay, Carolyn? Carolyn? Um, yes. Um, I, I would like to um, recommend um, that we identify our, our special board meetings by listing the purpose um, there it is. And by that, I would mean, um, I would motion to modify it to the virtual special board meeting to appoint a library trustee. I just noticed with multiple special board meetings, you know, throughout the year, you know, you go in this month and that month. And if you're really looking for a particular meeting, you don't know what that special board meeting was for. And that's why I thought we might want to consider just altering that a little bit. Uh, Patty? Patty? My concern is I can see doing it for this meeting, but if we're dealing with stuff pertaining to employees, is that wise? Yeah, I don't know that I would do it for other meetings. Uh, this, this one, I, I think it'd probably be okay, but I have another comment over here from Linda. Um, it's actually right under the executive session piece. It says that it has for the purpose of interviewing candidates for the position of library trustee. So it's already mentioned in there. So if you did a search, it should pop up. But when you pull up special board meetings on the website, that's all you see, special, special. You don't see the purpose. We don't know when it's a budget meeting. We don't know when it's a levy meeting. We don't know when it's to appoint a new trustee. So I thought it would be more transparent. That was my reason. Still should be able to do a search and it would show. That's my opinion. And like I say, I'm concerned because we can't do that for all of our special meetings. Only uh, all of our executive, because some of them are personal nature. And therefore we- Well, the, the terminology would be general. Okay. But That's it's your choice. So um, we have a movement and a seconder. Um, do the, uh, does the movement and seconder accept this uh, friendly amendment or, or not? I'm, I'm so, hearing that. I, I, don't, I, I don't think it's necessary. I think it sets a precedent. Okay, thank you. I have a, another motion to modify. Well, um, um, this is this also an If one of us denies it, then get yes, it. it is, please. Okay. Uh, a motion to modify others present. I noticed we only included two 
other candidates' names. I'd like to suggest that we include all the candidates up in, in that category, others present. May, if I might say, I, we, I did do that intentionally. I feel like it's not fair to people that have put themselves out to run for trustee um, to expose the fact that they tried and they didn't succeed. So that was a deliberate choice that we'll do whatever the board wants, but, um, but to me, it makes more sense just to name the ones that actually. Uh, well, you didn't put you didn't put Kadar up there. No, oh, Mayor. No. You You've put got, um, okay. you put Becky oh. and you put Thomas. Yeah, no, I do see that. I think it's just because they were on the screen at the very beginning, so that they. Oh, were, I understand. Yeah. But remember, you also gave these names to the newspaper. I uh, think it's already been published. That was foiled. I did not want to do that. I was my hand was forced. Well, you I, think it's you think it's it's a negative for people to know that they applied. I mean, I, I thought it would be complimentary, but if that's how you feel, okay. That's my opinion, so I'll stop talking. Well, I have a question right. about that. What's that? I have a question about the that FOIA. Okay. I don't know if I should wait until we go through that report or is now an appropriate time. About that. Uh, are you talking about, well, okay, right now we're talking about the minutes. Does it relate okay. to the minutes or? No. Okay, but but do bring it up later, okay? Okay. Thanks. Uh, all right, so we're looking at these minutes still. Uh, so I'm asking whether the movement and the second or accept these proposed changes, these friendly amendments to their motion. I can't even remember who is the movement. Was it Ms. Patty? Um, I don't know. I, I think Eddie I'm second and no, we it's not necessary. Eddie? If one of us denied, isn't it denied? Well, I mean, if, if we vote it down, um, then a different motion can be made to amend it in a different way. Um you know what? Fine. Can it be amended in a different way? Well, okay. What are, what are you saying fine to? Are you are you agreeing to the proposed change? No. Uh, well, although I'm not actually sure, is, Carolyn. If, if we deny it, then can there be a modification of what she what she wants? If you uh, don't agree or, to modification, the one that. The one I have an issue with is the one I mentioned. Uh, as long as we do it in such a way where some of them can still be listed as general and not put what they are. Okay. All right, we're not talking about that anymore. We're talking about her new uh, request to change the minutes. And that is to list the individuals who are present as being all the applicants that we've talked to on that evening of October 15th. So I think, Carolyn, am I correct? You want all the applicants to be listed. Is that correct? That, that was my suggestion, yes. All right. So I'm asking if the movement and the seconder would accept that as a friendly amendment to their motion to approve these minutes. And the movement is Patty. Hmm. I'm not sure. It was Diane. Pardon? And Diane? It was Diane. I already said it's not necessary. Okay. Okay. Can I make a friendly amendment to that amendment to ask Susan then to just indicate the two candidates who did win? Well, that, that, that would make sense because that seemed to be... Okay. Uh, in line with the original intent. Um, so okay, Diane you. and Patty, do you accept that? Yes. yes. All right. Okay. So we have a motion to pass the minutes of October 15th as amended to indicate the two people who were actually selected. Thank you. Okay. Could we have a roll call on that? Okay. Diane? Karen? Yes. Carolyn? Yes. Becky? Yes. Diane? 
Yes. Umar. Did he click out? Mayor, can you uh, hear us? Uh, I'm, I'm, mute. I'm frozen and I'm not able to, I don't know if anyone can hear me. We can hear I you. Yes. We can hear you. Yeah. So can you hear how us? do you vote on the minutes? I mean, you you can either. Uh, I, I, my screen is frozen and I can't hear. Oh, okay. Can anyone hear me? Sorry. Yeah, yeah. We can I'm going to dial in again. Can you put it in the chat? There's no chat. All right. Um, can you hear well, us now? I, I mean, I will say that, uh, Becky and Omer, I'm not, since you weren't actually board members, you might want to pass anyway on this, but I mean, that's up to you. Um, oh, good point. <laughs> 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 yes. Um, yeah. True. So, all so right. Should they abstain? Abstain. Um, I mean, you know, yeah. that's that's often what's ha what happens uh, when a person hasn't been at the meeting. Um, so, Umer, can you hear us at all now? I can hear you, but I can't talk. Can you hear me? Yes. yes. We can hear you. Okay. We can hear you. Um, I'm. I'm having a, my bandwidth is going really low. I'm gonna to try to uh, reconnect via my phone. Uh, okay. So I can't really, I, I understand what we're voting on, but I can't understand the vote. So I'm gonna to try to reconnect. And then if you need to get it from me, then uh, give me about a minute and I'll try to reconnect. Okay. Okay, thanks. I'm fine. Do you want to spend the sense. rest of us until then? Yeah. How about you, Patty? Yes. And Linda. Yes. Okay. Um, did everyone vote so far? Except Omar. Okay. All right. So we have another uh, one to vote on after that. We have two more. Two more. Oh, geez, two more. <laughs> oh yeah, the 28th too, okay. Okay, this is done. We have a quorum, right? So we can go ahead with the next. Well, yeah. I guess we could, I, I sort of just wanted to wait, wait for Mayor if he was coming back quickly, but you know, at this point, I think we might just have to move ahead. Um, so I'm going to I'm going to just acknowledge that uh, Omer is temporarily gone from the meeting, and we'll continue with our meeting, and hopefully he can join us shortly. So Diane, uh, you have everyone's vote on that one. Is that correct? Yes, I do. Thank you. All right. Fine. Then we're moving on to the next one, which oh, is. Oh, but let me just ask, yes, Becky, you abstained, correct? Yes, correct. Okay. Thank you, Becky. Um, so the next we have uh, the approval of the minutes of the virtual regular board meeting of October 21st, 2020. So do I have a motion to approve these minutes? Motion. Uh, who made that? Me. Patty, and was there a second? Yes. Becky, okay. Yes. All right, do we have any comments or questions about this set of minutes? No. Okay. All right. Can I have a roll call then? Okay. Karen? Yes. Carolyn? Yes. Becky? Yes. Diane? Yes. Uh, Umir is that? Okay. Uh, Patty? Yes. Linda? Yes. Okay. Okay. All right. We'll move on to the last set of minutes. And that is to approve the minutes of the virtual special board meeting of October 28th. 2020. This, that of course, was the very short meeting we had to uh, um, dealing with the uh, intergovernmental agreement that we had. So, do, oh, Omer's back. Good. Um, so, do I have a motion to approve the minutes for the special board meeting of October 28, 2020? Patty? 
Can yes. Do I have a second? Motion. That, Diane, did I hear Diane? Okay. All right. Are there any uh, comments or corrections to the board meeting minutes uh, for October 28th, 2020? I enjoyed the shortest meeting one. ever. <laughs> it was, <laughs> Carolyn? Um, well, I'm, I was going to recommend identifying the special board meeting, but I'll pass on that one. Um, I, I motion to amend the last sentence to include in the amount of $5,000. Um, we indicate district library. Um, oh, we passed the resolution, the last few words, um, authorizing the agreement in the amount of $5,000. Nowhere in this does it say how much uh, the agreement covers from the CARES Act. That is how much we're likely to get from it. Is that what you mean, Carolyn? Yes, yes. Right. Because that's okay. what we approved or voted on or, or agreed or something. Okay. We applied All right. for it. All right. so, so if I may, if I may add a couple of uh, comments, um, the intergovernmental uh, agreement was not for an amount; it was to establish a relationship, and then separate and apart from that, but under that agreement was the application to uh, receive reimbursement up to five thousand dollars. Okay, well, it's up to the government no. to decide whether we get it. Is that correct? Right, but in order for us to make that application, we had to have uh, uh, an intergovernmental agreement establishing that relationship between us and I believe Cook County. Uh, because we were the flow through uh, body that the money came to us right. through Cook County, right? Right, so there's, there really isn't an amount for the intergovernmental okay. agreement. Not until okay, we get, get it, is that correct then, Greg? Well, you know, again, the, the agreement is to establish the relationship. The, um, the $5,000 uh, submission is under that agreement, but separate and apart from it. Okay, you know, is, right. by any chance the CARES agreement is somewhere extended? Right. Uh, is it possible that through the same intergovernmental agreement, we might get additional funds flowing through to us? Yeah, I would assume so. Okay. Oh, okay. All right. Thank you for that clarification, Greg. All right, thanks, All right. Greg. All right, um, Carolyn, based on that, do you, do you want any more? Do you, did you want to pursue that or, or not? No, 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 it's fine. Thank you. Okay. All right, fine. Any other questions or comments regarding the minutes of October 28th? Okay. Uh, may we have a roll call then? Okay, Karen? Yes. Carolyn? Yes. Becky? Yes. Diane? Yes. Mayor? Yes. Patty? Yes. Linda? Yes. And as long as we have Umer back, could I ask him how he wants to vote for the first set of minutes? Okay, so for the 15th, I'm going to abstain, and for the 21st, I'm going to vote to approve. Okay. Uh, apologies, I, I, I'm, having, I, I, I'm having video trouble as well, so I'm... No apologies <laughs> necessary. No worries. <laughs> Try to show my face as much as I can. We're not thank you for uh, quick keeping. For... We're glad you're keeping it track. Yeah, Carolyn. Did we forget public comments or were there? No, not? no, it's coming up. It's uh, oh. number seven. Number seven. So oh, it's, it it's... just seems like the meeting. Is yeah, well, right. we're just on five. <laughs> Well, you know, we, we would usually do it earlier, but I think we had some guests that we wanted to okay. get them in and out of the meeting. And so, yeah, but we're coming up on it very quickly. Uh, the only other All thing right. we yeah. have in front of that, uh, in front of public comment on our agenda is election of officers. Now, as you may recall, our bylaws provide that we need to uh, uh, elect an interim or, or what, uh, an interim uh, president and all other officers between the time when we lose a board member and when we get a new board member. We did that. Uh, but now our bylaws provide that we need to do another election that <laughs> will establish officers from this point on until the next election, which is May. So it's just a six month period of time. And then in May, 
when all the elected, the newly elected board members are seated, there'll be elections again. So I just wanna clarify what this election is for and why we're doing it again. So um, that's what we're gonna proceed with right now. So now what we need are uh, nominations for the offices. So, um, all right, did all right. I do have questions or did you wanna- No, uh, I have very nominations. Okay, all right, um, all right. Well, first of all, uh, I'll, now, first of all, I'll ask for nominations for the office of president. Oh, Are there sorry. any nominations? Are this there is any Umer, I nominate Karen. Yes, Umer? Uh, I nominate you. Um, all right, uh, thank you very much, Umer. Uh, thank you. Um, May I Linda? second Okay, all right, thank you. I don't know if we need a second, but thank you anyway. All right. Are there any other uh, nominations for the office of president? No. Mm -mm. All right. Okay. All right. Fine. Um, so uh, we need to take a vote then. Um, I think we elect. Yeah, I think we take a vote on each office. Mm -hmm. Is what we do. So okay. Diane. So Karen. We yes yes. <laughs> okay, Carolyn. Yes. Becky? Yes. Diane? Yes. Umir? Yes. Patty? Yes. Linda? Yes. Okay. Thank you very much. I'm with you for another six months, but then we'll <laughs> see. Anyway. All right. Nominations are now in order for the Office of Vice President. And I'd like to move that uh, Linda Ryan uh, be nominated for Vice President. Are there other nominations? Okay, um, hearing none, um, I'd like to hear a vote. Diane, would you do the vote, please? Okay, uh, Karen? Oh, no. Yes. Carolyn? Yes. Becky? Yes. Diane? Yes. Mayor? Yes. Patty? Yes. Linda? Yes. Okay, great. All right, uh, so nominations are now in order for the Office of Secretary. Do I have any nominations for the Office of Secretary? Patty. Diane Olson. All right, Diane has served as our secretary for a number of years now. That, uh, are there any other nominations? Okay, all right. Um, then may I have a roll call? Okay, Karen. Yes. Carolyn. Yes. Becky. Yes. Diane. Yes. Mayor. Yes. Uh, Patty. Yes. Linda. Yes. Okay, finally, nomination. nominations are now in order for the Office of Treasurer. Uh, do I have any nominations for the Office of Treasurer? I nominate Patty. Okay, all right. Are there any other nominations for the Office of Treasurer? Okay, then um, there be no further nominations. Uh, Diane, would you do a roll call? Hey, Karen. Yes. Carolyn? Yes. Becky? Yes. Diane? Yes. Umer? Yes. Patty? Yes. Linda? Yes. Okay, thank you. We'll try and hold down the fort until the next election. Thank and, you. <laughs> okay, all right. So um, now we do have public <laughs> comment. Um, Susan Lemke, can you tell us, are there any uh, members of the public who are interested in presenting public comment? I did not receive any public comments in advance. Um, looks like Mr. Yassel would like to make a comment. Okay, Mr. Yassel. There you are. Uh, hi, Mr. Yassel, how are you? Great, how are you? Fine, fine. Uh, so we are in that segment of our meeting for public comment. Did you wish to uh, address the board? Excellent. Yes. Yes. Uh, good evening, board and staff. Um, I'd like to congratulate the two new board members that are on the board. Um, I hope you, you are like sponges. Uh, you gather you. information. You uh, have your own opinion. Uh, you express your own opinion. And... Um, also keep in mind it is a, a team effort as far as board goes and um, it's all for the betterment of the Niles residents at the end of it. Um, 
I did notice a few things with um, tonight's meeting um, after the session of public comments um, with uh, the consideration of uh, solar panels uh, going forward for the top of the roof and everything. Um, that's cool. We can talk about it more, but um, really with the expenditures involved, I really don't think it's financially viable but it is in good interest of uh, trying to conserve energy and all that. Um, but going forward with everything, with the way things are, I mean, the library just uh, closed down again. We're not having as many patrons coming through. And um, I, I would recommend trying to see how the library can operate uh, at a lower mm -hmm. level of uh, financing during this lockdown compared to the last lockdown that we had where we didn't spare any finances. And uh, it was honestly, I think it was a good thing. It did keep a lot of people employed and paid and taken care of. And I really, that's what we all want. We want to make sure that everybody keeps their job, maintains their job. They're able to take care of their families, put food on the table and uh, take care of bills and all of that. Um, but we also need to remember that we are a library and um, anything that we can do as a library with all the, including um, having extracurricular services, um, such as um, I, I know the event with the, with the chalk drawings was a, was a success. And um, the bingo nights with the village. I, I, I think um, including the community more with library activities will be a good thing going forward. And uh, I do want to see that more often. So uh, that's all I have to say. And I hope you all have a good night. I hope you all are staying healthy. I hope you get a good night's sleep. So. You too. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. I do not see any other hands up. So. All right, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Yassel, and um, uh, we appreciate your uh, kind words to us. And uh, I think that will, since there are no other um, people interested in commenting, that brings that section of our meeting to a close. And we then move on to trustee reports. Uh, trustee reports, the president is listed first. Uh, just like all the rest of you, I, of course, attended our special uh, board meeting regarding the, inter the intergovernmental agreement. I also uh, talked with Susan Lemke regarding the uh, unfortunate progress of the pandemic recently and how the library is reacting, but I'm gonna let her discuss that more as it's on our agenda a little later in the meeting. Um, so I will now um, say that we'll do our next one. Uh, usually we do treasurer next. So I think I'll turn it over to Patty if uh, you'd like to do your treasurer's report. And then I'll give the other uh, trustees an opportunity to uh, discuss anything they've uh, uh, done with respect to the library during the past month. Patty? Thank you. Uh, November is the month we give uh, the report for the fifth month of our fiscal year. We are 42% of the way through the year. Uh, page nine, revenues. Uh, property taxes are at 39% of the budget. Investments at 74%. Thank you, Greg. Uh, total revenues are at 40%. Uh, expenditures is at 35%. Library materials, which is on page 10, is at 36%. Library operation expenses is at 27%. General and administration is at 32% of the budget. Employee fringe benefits is at 35% of the budget. Utilities is at 29% of the budget. Audit and total expenditures are at 78%. Social security is at 35%. Workman's comp is at 61. Now, Greg, isn't that, if I remember correctly, because we only pay it a couple of times a year? 
Uh, yeah, we all, we we pay uh, workers' compensation at the beginning of the year for the entire year. Uh, this month, um, I believe it's this month, we received a refund of about ten thousand dollars. It's uh, I think it's like ninety nine fifty six or something like that. Um, after the close of uh, the year, um, we uh, were audited. Um, and when we're audited, uh, they look at all the wages that have been paid and, and assess uh, uh, an insurance rate against them. Mm -hmm. What was uh, beneficial this year is because a lot of our uh, staff was working from home, um, that's a lower rate than if they're working in the office, even if they're, uh, even if they're clerical in nature, which the bulk of them are clerical in nature. And what that resulted in is a $10,000 refund from uh, from the prior year. Because it, you know, if you think about it, it was almost four months. It was uh, all of, uh, well, part of March and then uh, April, May, and June. Mm -hmm. Okay, and then we have unemployment compensation is at 5%. Building and equipment is at 15% and total expenditures is at 27%. Um, I thought this time I was looking at the checks and I saw anything over 10,000. I thought, well, we should, I should check on and see what it's really pertaining to. And uh, one check number, on page 17, check number 79334 was for uh, Blue Cross Blue Shield, and that's, you know, insurance. And they pay a block, the library pays, and then if the, the employees pay the library back then for what their share of it is, um, if I remember correctly. Isn't that the way it, it was? it is, Greg? Yeah, so we assess price tags um, on the various levels of insurance um, based upon uh, those price tags. Uh, the employees pay approximately uh, $6,000, maybe $6,200 a month for, uh, uh, for the insurance. The library decided a long time ago to subsidize uh, single coverage at 90% and to subsidize coverage beyond single coverage at 75%. So all, all in all, it's a little over, uh, you know, it's a little over 10%, maybe about 12 or 13% because the bulk of our insurance is single coverage. Mm -hmm. Okay, page 18, there was a check for uh, number 79345. And that was for $22,133.72. And that was for um, cooperative uh, computers. And that's a service that does for all of the libraries, I thought, or at least the libraries in our area. So we get a better rate for our computer coverage because of them. So that's actually better than it could have been if we had to go out on our own. Yeah, so, uh, so you've heard Susan talk about CCS from time to time. Uh, that's the consortium that we belong to. And <laughs> I'm sorry? I'm sorry, I'm not laughing at you. I'm laughing at the person who coughed. Okay. So um, uh, CCS provides uh, our uh, the backbone um, of our... Um, uh, business operation software, which is, you know, to keep track of the books and the materials and uh, who has what and where they are in the library and uh, so on and so forth, as well as all the patron information. Um, and uh, we pay uh, about $22,000 a quarter. So about uh, just short of $90,000 on the year. Um, to do that. Um, to be a standalone library, uh, we'd have um, a lot more expense than that. Um, you know, just the licensing alone would be significant, not to mention the uh, computers to uh, run the software and uh, the personnel to maintain the database and, and operate it. We'd probably have to go up by a headcount of one. On page 19, there's a check 79361, which is for InfoUSA Marketing, which is another consortium, isn't it? 
Uh, that's actually a, um, uh, a vendor that provides uh, some of our database products that are available for uh, patrons. Okay. Uh, I, I don't know exactly which ones those are, um, but you know we see these expenses throughout the year. We've budgeted, I believe, uh, two hundred and forty thousand dollars for the entire year um, for uh, databases, which is comparable to the previous years. And then on page twenty, we have seven nine. 367, which is for Ken Thorpe and Jenkins, which is our lawyers. And, and that was for 11,271 and 28 cents, which $9,687 of that is for the lawsuit that was brought against the library by Mr. McCullough. And uh, it's still open, so ch chances are we're going to be spending more. Um, uh, page 21 was for Project uh, Inc., which was 37000 Now, was that a consortium also, right? Or what was that? Uh, which one is that? Um, uh, 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 oh, ProQuest? Yeah. Uh, yeah, those are for online databases as well, $37,000. Okay. Um, those were the main checks that I saw that were stood out to me. And if anybody has anything else to add, please be my guest. Oh, Just want to clarify idea. something Becky, um, that, to back up to that uh, lawsuit from Mr. McCullough. That is for the um, the thing that didn't get into the vote. Is that right? Right. That's our attorney's uh, fees right. for that. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Pat, Patty, you said that's not over yet, but it, isn't that over? I mean, I think we did get a ruling on that and it was. They uh, continued. They continued it last I heard. They were continuing it to, I think sometime this week or maybe mm -hmm. last week. Okay. Um, yeah, so they, they're they still going back to court one more time. Okay, okay, I'm sorry. All right, so we will hear more about that too. Can I ask a Go question? On. Did Patty say the total amount was for the lawsuit or just a portion? No, no, only 9,687 was for the lawsuit. The rest was for other legal questions, which there's always legal questions that come up just from the running of the library. Okay, and this is for that, um, I think, I think this is a lawsuit for not filing that citizen's petition for term limits, right? Yeah. Is that what we're talking right. about? Yeah. Right. Okay. All right. Based Thank on you. our uh, attorney's advice, the uh, question was uh, not placed on the ballot or not certified. Is that the word, um, right. Susan? Not certified. Um, so okay. that is the issue. Uh, again, that was done on the advice of the attorneys, and they are now defending uh, that lawsuit. So um, we'll mm. see where that goes. Okay. All right, thank you. All right, were there other questions on um, Patty's treasurer's report? All right, uh, seeing none. Now, Umair, if you, if you have a question, please say something because I can't see you, therefore I can't see if you're raising your hand. So um, just, <laughs> just, just say something. Understood. Um, okay. Um, are there um, any reports from any other trustees regarding library activities that they might have engaged in during the past month? Okay, seeing none, we will uh, move on um, and to the payment of the bills. Do I have a motion to approve the operating expenses of $233,608.41, payroll expenses of $273,901.28, for a total of monthly expenses of $507,509.69. Do I sit to motion? Me? Yes. Patty? Is there a second? Yes. Uh, I'm sorry, who, who Becky. gave the second? It's Becky. Oh, Becky, thank you. All right. Are there any questions or comments regarding the payment of the bills for this month? I Carol. have a few. Carol, you yes. know, I have a question. I have a question also about the balance sheet. Can I like direct that to Greg real quickly? 
Uh, you mean the balance sheet on page eight? That balance sheet, is that the one you're talking about? Yes, yes, somehow I. All right, okay. Just real quick, there's a um, deferred revenues, Greg. Is that not received revenues? Is that what that represents or did we receive them? I'm confused. It's under liability for 2006. 62902. So, so that represents um, that represents the the monies that were were showing as receivable primarily um, for the uh, 2019 uh, tax levy, um, which only took us through uh, you know which only takes us through the middle of the year. So in other words, when when we uh, when the board levies the taxes, they become receivable as of uh, January 1st, and then we collect monies against that. Um, because it it's for the entire year, half of that is viewed as deferred. So just like uh, when you sell your house, if you sold your house on July 1st, you would only pay for the first six months of real estate taxes because you only lived in your house for six months. And you would get a credit for the um, for the last six months uh, of the year. So in, in effect, you're, you're only paying for half the year. This operates very similar to that. And it's an entry that we make... It's excuse me. It's an entry that we make at the end of the year, and we don't adjust it during the year. We just make it as of July uh, or as of uh, June thirtieth, uh, in preparation for the audit. So, by being labeled deferred, we did not receive that two million, or we did. Uh, we did not receive it. There's okay. a receivable. There's a, excuse me. There's a receivable at the top of the on on the top of the balance sheet for about two point seven million, I think, or thereabouts, maybe two point eight. I don't have it in front of me, and um, that amount is receivable. In other words, we haven't actually uh, we actually haven't gotten the funds. Okay. Okay. No. I'm so. Actually, yes, under receivables, it's two million forty-three. So that much we received. The two, the one I just brought up, we're, we're still expecting to receive that because it's a liability, right? Well, you generally don't receive liability liabilities. Well, I meant liability, meaning it's owed us. No, it's it's the unearned portion of the real estate taxes that we recognized uh, in uh, in the receivables. So unearned something we expect or just the amount you requested? Uh, unearned, uh, the unearned portion of the levy, which is recognized in the receivables at the, t at the top of the sheet. Okay, so we only received two million seven and this was Two million six. So this is a little higher than what we received. Yeah, I, I I don't have those numbers. I'd have to go into work papers, uh, and I don't have those. Numbers oh no, and I'm not, I'm not holding you to the numbers. I'm thinking, does that mean we just got less than we expected, since no. the receivable is less? No. No, the way okay. uh, the way that uh, the county. Uh, the county disperses property taxes is mm -hmm. is that you know, the first estimate is uh, dispersed at fifty five percent of the previous year, and then the second and then the second payment is is the balance because okay. we, uh, the board decided to abate a million dollars in May before they finalized it. We received about five hundred thousand dollars more. Uh, before the end of the year than, um, than we normally would because of the way that the, you know, the uh, tax rules uh, operate. So that's why usually those two numbers uh, are exactly the same and offset each other. But this year, because okay. we received more money sooner because of the tax abatement, 
um, it, they're a little bit out of balance by about, you know, five or six hundred thousand dollars. Okay. All right. Thank, uh, that, well, that's the, that's the first thing that caught my eye. They weren't equal. Okay. That's fine. I understand. Thank you. And then I just had a few questions about a few checks. Um, I noticed on page 15, there's a check to Village Plumbing and Sewer for $4,720. Did we have like a major repair? Uh, we do uh, we do several things with village. Um, very often we have them come out and do uh, uh, maintenance types of things to prevent problems. You know, make sure the drains are clear. Um, you know, there's there's a drain in particular in the east parking lot that they uh, that they go out and clear. Um, it would cost us quite a bit to actually correct that issue. Uh, and then sometimes um, if we need, um, you know, some type of plumbing work that's, you know, repair that's beyond Dave Dabrowski's uh, capabilities, we'll have uh, Village Plumbing come in and do it. Okay, so this, apparently this is a, an accumulation of, I thought maybe we had a major break, but this is an, an accumulation yeah. of invoices or something, yeah. right? Well, that's, I, think, I don't have the yeah. invoice in front of me, so I can't comment specifically, but the, the types of things that Village Plumbing does is are, are as I described. Okay, that sounds good, thank you. And then um, way in, on the income statement, the consolidated income statement, page 12, I noticed group health is, about six thousand dollars higher, and I was wondering what what attributed to that. I mean, I, I thought it was always a set price. Yeah. So yeah. Um, um, what happens is we have uh, we have a plan as stated, and uh, during this mm -hmm. pandemic, we've had issues uh, with uh, some some employees losing their health coverage because uh, a spouse maybe uh, got furloughed or is uh, unemployed um, um. or has otherwise lost their uh, health insurance. So uh, what the Blue Cross Blue Shield contract allows for is for uh, circumstances such as those, uh, they have the option to uh, get onto our coverage. Um, oh, okay, that's understandable. Yeah. I was concerned it was an increase out of the blue. Okay, thank you for that. And then my last question I noticed, under electric, there's no actual monthly cost. Is that because this new service kind of bills you whenever they do? Sometimes it was extremely high. I remember last year we had exorbitant bills and we had to work with them. Is that why it seems to be blank right now? Uh, well, it is in fact blank. Um, uh, we received the bills for uh, this period early and they were included in last month's uh, financial statement. So if you look back, you'll see a little more expense in that line than, uh, than you would otherwise expect. Okay. Do they bill, they don't, they bill us on their period, not our monthly basis? Is that what it is with them? Uh, I'm not yeah. exactly. I'm not exactly sure what that period is, but because of the okay. way because of the way that you know that the board meetings move around and stuff, uh, sometimes they get early and sometimes they get you know a little bit late. So, you know, should okay. be back should be back to normal next month. All right. Thank you. That's my. Those are my only questions. Appreciate it. Hey, Carolyn. Thank you. Anyone else have any questions about the treasurer's report? I mean, about the payment of the bills. The payment of the bills. I meant. Okay, I believe that motion is uh, still pending. We do have a movement in a second, do we, Diane? Yes, we do. Okay, would you call the roll then? Uh, Karen? Yes. Carolyn? Um, no. Becky? Thank you. Sorry, yes. Uh, Diane? Yes. I'm here. Yes. Patty? Yes. Linda? Yes. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. We'll move to the next item on our agenda, which is the director's report. 
Uh, we do have an extensive written director's report in our packet. Thank you very much for Susan for providing all that information. There's quite a bit of information about what all the staff members are doing. Um, I just wanted to start off by saying uh, congratulations on a couple of counts. One from Jan Chukowski, the comment about uh, winning the 2020 John Cotton Dana Award for Excellence in Library uh, Public Relations. Um, I personally thought the uh, Best Deal Ever campaign was really a great one. It really appealed to me, I know that. Well, and I think I it did to a lot of our patrons. Uh, so I was pleased to see that too. I was also pleased to see the award to Judy McNulty, who won um, a Chamber, Chamber Member of the Year Award at the Niles Night of the Roses. Um, was that a specific award? I, I know that they have a number of awards during the evening at the Night of the Roses, and I wasn't sure if what you know what that was for. Can you tell us any more about that, Susan? I, I think it is for being the Chamber the chamber member of the year. So the individual member of the chamber who has done something special or that they want to honor in some way. And Judy okay. does, she is a very energetic person and she really hustles. And so I'm very, very glad to see her acknowledged. That's true. Um, now I will open it up for questions, but first I wanna ask, is there anything you'd like to add to your written report or elaborate on? Um, since you said no, it out. I think a lot of what is on my mind is relating to our COVID discussion a little bit later. I do want to point the board's attention to page 39 with the trustee calendar. Uh, for any people who are considering running for trustee or who know somebody who is considering running for trustee, we are now in the period where you do need to be collecting signatures. We do have petition packets here at the library that can be picked up and they will have to be submitted in December the week of December 14th to 21st. Mm -hmm. so just wanted to make sure that that was on everybody's radar. Right. Uh, and Thank then, you. Uh, Becky, you said you had a question about the FOIA. I do, yes. Um, so that is page 38. 38, thank you. Um, I'm just wondering if that's like a normal thing they do every time board members are um, appointed or elected and then what do they do with that information? Uh, well, she put it at the end of her article. Um, she, she is a reporter. And no, I have never been FOIA'd by a reporter before. I, I how much did that cost the library? <laughs> yeah, but we're, we're, we're very transparent. I, the only reason I didn't do this one is because I did want to protect the people that had graciously run for trustee. And, you know, I thought it was mean to give that information out and uh, completely unnecessary to the point of the article. But she disagreed and our attorney said that I did have to give that to her. It was public, but that all personal information and anything to do with families, um, minor children had to be redacted. So it took a while. And so how much did we pay? We had to pay for that then? Uh, yeah, so well, and I don't know because that bill will be probably next month or the month after. Can I ask a question? Yes, before, before I had asked about FOIA's and the amount they cost us each month to be given to us, I would still appreciate that information. I know we've only gotten it like maybe one or two months. Yeah, it's, uh, to be honest, it's very hard to keep track of the amount of time okay. that we spend on them, but, um, but we can, we certainly know what we spend with the lawyers and right. they, you know we can try to recreate how much time we've spent, but it's very- it's Even really if it's perfect. just the lawyer fees, okay. that gives us something. Sure. Right. I think, yeah, I think we wanted to know the lawyer's fees because that you, you yeah. know, you can break out easily. That's up real quick. Right. Track yeah. of every minute of your time. And we know it's a lot, but it's harder to keep track of it and calculate what that's worth. Although we know it, it is. Well, the thing that's annoying to me is that sometimes people FOIA information and then they still put incorrect information on everything, Niles. The very information that they FOIA'd. That it's happened. interesting to me because she also called me and we had a conversation on the phone and there was nothing that we talked about on the phone that was in the article, not one iota. Uh, really? Hmm. Isn't that That's special? sort of a waste of all of our time, isn't it? Uh, yours and uh, our staff uh, responding to the FOIA, but oh well. Oh well, but that's yeah. all I have. If I yeah. have to answer any other questions. Thank you. I just wanted to make that clear. I didn't yeah. know if that was normal. Yeah. No. Okay. Um, 
All right, so we will move on. Then uh, communications, those are also in our, our packet, uh, unless you have anything to add to that. Uh, and I have some to... questions yes, on Carolyn. the director's report. Oh, yes, go are ahead. Are we moving past it? Well, um, sort of part of the director's report, but go ahead. Yes, anything under okay, director's yeah, report or on, communications. On page, on page 37, um, there's a chart, um, test positivity. And you know what, I um, I took the last column, the last row, because it's the most current date, and I, oh, 11, 6. I divided the total tested by the positive test, and I came up with 8.58. They're showing 11.7. This is Cook County. This is the, the Illinois Department of Health. We did not calculate this. This is however they are calculating. I know, that, that's just what I'm saying, like, like it doesn't make sense if you take the total and divide it by the positive. But it's I, to be with they multiply it all by a hundred thousand. It's a it's a complicated formula. All right. And so Carolyn, I, go Carolyn okay. I saw where they explained this on the news and they said there's a difference in the way Chicago, for example, figures it versus the state. Supposedly the state counts every test. If, if something, if somebody is tested more than once and comes up positive, they're counted as individual, I would, they said on the news. Where Chicago, they look at the individual. And if an individual tests positive twice, they count it once. So. All right, thank you for that. All right, and then on page 34, I noticed there are one, two, three. Um, I have some notes here. Um, page 34. Oh, within the director's report, which is about highlights of our, our library's activities, I noticed we, we listed three major capital projects. And um, therefore, replacement of, oh, the phone system, and then replacement of the outdoor digital sign panels. And lastly, for the, um, it looks like an RFP for the door access control system. Now I know we had conversations about these items and I know monies were um, placed in the special reserves, but we never discussed or reviewed these. And since these are capital projects, I would think they should be on our agenda so that as as trustees, we should be able to make a determine make a determination because they're quite costly, not necessarily emergency expenses, and we are in the middle of a pandemic. And I sort of almost missed them. I didn't expect to see capital projects in here. So I would like to mention in the future that we add these to our agenda and the board should discuss this. I mean, especially since these were items we talked about maybe a year ago and there's a drastic change in our circumstances right now. So um, that's what I would like to get some feedback on. Well, I, I, I just, point out they are in the capital project plan list, which this is from the IT port part that we, you know, I have asked my staff to let you know what they're working on. But they're going to be reluctant to reveal information if it then becomes this thing that they have to talk about before they're really prepared to talk about it. Rich will be bringing this information to the board when he's prepared to talk about it to the board. He's giving you a heads up here. He's giving you the idea of these are the projects that he sees on the horizon. They are in the special, you know, special reserve fund capital plan. They are things that, and they are things that all have to get done. So at the point where the board needs to put in their input, mm -hmm. it will come to the board. We're just trying to give you a little bit of early information on it. Um, I think but my I, position, I'm my position is, but, capital, um, there, are, there are millions of capital, there are millions of dollars worth of projects in our special reserves, which this board has not taken the time to review and reconsider 
especially now during a pandemic. I'm just saying, you know, everybody likes a new phone system. Is now the time for a new phone system when once again we're closing down the library? I mean, to spend money because it's something we might be able to use later during a pandemic, that seems wasteful. And you I don't know that we're phone. performing a, pardon me? You're using the phone. The phones are ringing off the hook. The staff is all I'm sure they in are. the building I'm sure and they the are. phones are ringing constantly. And, they, and as he says, end of service life. That's mm -hmm. why he's looking at it. He does not throw money around. But and again, I'm saying in the middle of a to... pandemic, this is quite expensive. And I think this board needs to decide if they want to spend this money right now before okay. your employees spend a great deal of time creating RFPs, contacting consultants. I mean, there's a lot of time and money we invest and spending money on things that maybe right now we don't need, especially since we don't know what tomorrow will bring. That's just my position on such costly spending and no board determination. All right, Patty, you had your hand up. Yes, um, I agree. We haven't talked about these for a while, but I was under the assumption that we had come up with some opinion or some, you know, what we were going to do pertaining to signage, it, but we, I know we did put it off. Right. And as far as phone, I thought we agreed to go ahead and get the information, not that we voted to pay for it because we didn't have all the information. Um, I personally feel collecting information is part of what you do as a board. And once we get the information, then we can discuss it, and then we can determine what we're going to do about it. Thank you. Okay. Um, Diane, did you have your hand up or no? Okay. All right. Fine. Uh, again, what we're doing right now is just reviewing the director's report. Uh, we're not making any expenditures right at the moment. So are there any other questions on the director's report? Or no, but I had a comment about that. Becky. Yes. Um, you know, I, as I've said a couple times already, I'm new to the procedures of all this. Um, I, I can see in the report that this is uh, still in the preliminary stages. Nobody is asking for any money at this point. I would think that this is something that would come out from the, um, the special fund or the special reserve fund, right? Not just from the regular fund. Mm -hmm. And in my own personal opinion, I think it actually is probably a good time to do something like this because patrons aren't in the building and it might make it a little bit easier and just as a frame of reference um, the displays library is doing the exact same thing this week okay uh, phone Thank system you. is that what you mean or just other yeah we're updating the phone systems this week as well okay all right okay um, any other uh, comments or questions about the director's report um, hearing none we'll move on to the next matter under new business which is uh, adapting the levy. So do I have a motion to adapt ordinance 20-05, which is an ordinance levying assessing taxes of the Niles Main District Library, Cook County, Illinois, for the fiscal year beginning July 1st, 2020 and ending June 30th, 2021. Patty, uh, is uh, I've got a motion? Is there a second? I, I second, Mrs. Okay. Mayor. Oh, okay, Umera, uh, you can have a second. second there. That's fine. <coughs> As you know, we all uh, discussed this at our meeting last month. We had a presentation from Greg Kretz. Greg, thank you for sending out your PowerPoint that you did uh, last month. I've got it. I printed out. I always like to look at these uh, a little bit more. Um, and uh, I always like to look at the history of our tax levies, uh, which to me is it is uh, an important thing to look at. Um, so we had Greg's presentation. We all directed uh, uh, Greg uh, and Susan uh, that we were in favor of keeping the levy flat. Now, as you look at our past years, our levy would be the same as last year and the year before and the year before that. Now, with, with a caveat that, of course, last year we decided to abate yeah, our levy due to the conditions uh, that we're now facing. Uh, and we can do that again this year if we decide to do that, but that's not what we're deciding right now. 
right now we're just looking at the levy itself. Uh, and the, the direction that was given to our staff was to uh, prepare the paperwork for a levy that would be the same amount as the past few years. Uh, so um, we do have a motion on the table to adopt that ordinance. Are there any other questions or comments uh, about this motion? Uh, seeing none, I will, Carolyn. I have a question. Did we want to discuss, um, I was going to make a friendly motion to switch these two items, the COVID plan before the, um, the vote on the levy, because I'm not sure just what that all entails and would that affect our levy? Because, you know, how is that going to uh, impact the library? Um, I only I mean, put the COVID plan yeah, on the on the agenda so that the board could discuss it if they wanted. I don't have uh, I don't have something to present, and I'm not making a proposal. It's just that I oh, thought okay. we would I like to kept we and to discuss it. Okay, this time I just thought we were headed somewhere, and maybe we wanted to discuss that. Um, I did want to make a couple of comments before we vote. I guess that's all we're going to do is vote right now. Is that the plan? Um, that would be the plan. Okay. Well, does anyone else have any comments? I don't see any hands up. Okay. Um, I just wanted to, um, to probably stress my, um, my thought process for this levy would be that the, the levy should reflect what we're actually going through right now, which is not at all um, a reflection of last year's year. And it seems when I went through the levy presentation, this year's levy presentation and last year's levy presentation, what we're doing actually is um, approving spending patterns during this pandemic equivalent to the spending patterns last year when the library was functioning at 100%. And that is, is extremely inaccurate in trying to represent what we should expect in the levy. Um, I, I don't think we're, we're doing our due diligence because we have some extraordinary expenses that we're, we're considering. And to be spending as much money with the library mostly closed as we did last year is seriously irresponsible on our part. We, I really thought we'd want to look further into that because I know it's not sitting well with the community. Were, were you done, Carolyn? Yes, thank you. Okay. Um, anyone else have any comments? Okay. All right. Uh, we did discuss this last week, and we did get a presentation regarding the library expenses. We're not really deciding on expenses so much now. We do that when we do the budget. But having said that, um, we did receive information uh, at our presentation last month regarding why many of our expenses remain the same and are not substantially reduced by the uh, uh, fact that we don't have as many staff in the library at the same time anymore. They're slightly reduced, uh, as Greg explained earlier. I think it was, was it our workers' comp insurance went down? Is that correct, Greg? Yes. Yeah, because people aren't in the, our staff aren't here. But, but that was a pretty small uh, reduction when you look at the overall uh, budget of the library. Uh, so we did address that. Um, were there any other questions or comments before we move to a vote on the levy? Uh, seeing no hands, I'll ask Diane to do a roll call. Karen? Yes. Carolyn? No. Becky? Yes. Diane? Yes. Umair? Yes. Patty? Yes. Linda? Yes. Okay. Um, thank you, board members. Um, Susan, um, Diane Olson and I 
need to sign off on the secretary's certificate and the ordinance, which we usually do when we're sitting there in person or whoever is president. And, um, I'm not sure how you want to handle it. Um, if you don't know now, you can just call me later. Um, and we'll take care of that. I think Diane was going to at least come get Di Diane Olson's signature. Uh, if Diane is around tomorrow, I'd like to stop by. I'll call you. Yeah, fine. Okay, and I don't know, Karen, are you working from home? Uh, I'm working from home, so uh, unless okay, I'm in so a meeting- I can give you a call tomorrow. Do that, please. Thank you very much. Okay, that's great. All right, fine. Um, then we'll move on to the next item on our agenda, which is um, something that I'm, I'm really interested in hearing uh, in particular, and that is current COVID plans. Every month, uh, things are changing for us, just like the rest of the world. Um, so I, I want to hear where we are right now. Susan? Yeah, um, well, it's been an interesting week, I must say. We, uh, we, we keep looking at the plans. We look at the phases and the tiers and the mitigation and, and, the, and the directors all get together and share information, you know, try to hear from their village managers and things like that, what information they might have. Um, I had a meeting this week with all the, the institutions of Niles Township, so um, like, seven or eight school districts and the park districts, libraries, villages, and then and Niles Township itself. And they all shared information. And basically what it comes down to is nobody had planned on closing quite yet. And yet the COVID rate has just become overwhelming. Um, so all of the schools are closing and, or, you know, they are doing their adaptive pause is what they are calling it. And uh, that will be through the beginning of January, some of them to January 4th, some of them to Martin Luther King Day. And um, I had anticipated if we went to tier three based on the recommendations, we would have to you know, pr pretty much stop everything, but th they did go to tier three, but they changed all the recommendations. So it's making it extremely difficult to plan. You really can't figure out what the next step is because they change it all the time. But from what I see, of the tier three recommendations now, I think everything that we have in place right now, which is that the building is uh, not open for people to come browse anymore, but we're doing our no contact holds pickup, we are delivering to the seniors and the homebound, and we are offering computer appointments, technology appointments really, because realistically speaking, a lot of them are after the copier and the scanning station rather than actually a computer. So we're offering those three services at this time and I, I can't see any reason not to keep doing that for now. Um, the What most library directors and other people are kind of speculate is that the governor will not lock down the state until the retail establishments have had a chance to make some money and they make <laughs> the most money on Black Friday. So he's not going to shut anybody down until then. We are all kind of anticipating that at some point we will be in another lockdown. And at that point, I will be having staff be working from home. So one of the things that I would like to hear from the board is if you are prepared again to ha have the staff be working from home and just be paid their, um, their scheduled hours. I would hope that we would do that. Once again, it is once again budgeted. And um, most people are able to work from home at least most of their time. There are a few positions, um, you know, maintenance still comes into the building. IT still comes into the building. There's some things coming in. Um, there are a few positions where say a shelver there, you really cannot shelve at home. There's nothing you can do. So they have a few meetings and they have some professional development type activities. They are not, realistically speaking, working their full hours, but I would still hate to kick them off of our roles. Um, that is another thing that the library directors have discussed. That the, that one of the libraries did furlough staff last time, and she said that it, she would never do that again if she, there was any way she could avoid it, because it's a huge administrative burden trying to keep track of everybody's, you know, COBRA payments and uh, their IMRF co contributions, it's a, just a ton of paperwork. And then it makes it extremely difficult to reopen because you've kicked everybody off of your communications. And it, it makes it just uh, incredibly burdensome to, and, and of course you lose some people along the way. So mm -hmm. I'm, I am hopeful that the board will support once again, the staff continuing to be paid 
if we do have to go into lockdown. Uh, if we don't go into lockdown, we are prepared to keep doing what we're doing and let the patrons back in as soon as we think it's safe. So All right, that's Patty, you had what I've got. Uh, Patty, I think you had your hand up first. I see you, Linda. I'll be. I'll ask you to talk next if you don't mind, Patty. The only ex the one experience I have is dealing with P um, some of the staff who does who do Zoom meetings for the residents, either. The one does it at from home, and then she does it when she's at work. Yeah. And it's very obvious. You could tell the difference. But, you know, because she does her meetings every week. Yeah. And so, I mean, even if they're – and beyond that, just for the Zoom meeting, the amount of research she does to set up for the Zoom meetings, and she emails people all this stuff so that they have it before the Zoom meeting, I mean – I. Just to say, oh, she does a meeting isn't sufficient to cover what she actually does. Yeah. And I'm sure the other people are probably about the same. Right. Like Linda and I have discussed, because the library is closed down, doesn't mean the work is less. In some cases, it's more. Right. Everything we're doing is kind of inefficient right now. It's taking more steps and more hands to do everything. So it's kind of a nuisance. Linda, you had your hand up. Um, yeah, I actually was going to say pretty much the same thing Patty had just said. Um, you know, when people say the library is closed or that, you know, we could cut back. Honestly, I mean, working in a library myself um, today, I worked more hours doing what would normally take me probably two hours at work. It took me all day plus. And that was just doing book talks and checkouts because everything has to be bagged and everything's done over, you know, virtual. It's just so much more. And I think people just don't understand the process and how much work. But my other um, point I wanted to make was um, about the staff and the shelvers. Um, I know that we do also have a lot of part-time, so we're not paying a lot of um, other fringe benefits along with those positions. And also, um, I know that their salaries are probably one of, you know, some of the lower set salaries. So um, just as that are, as a reminder to our community that, you know, um, these are not the highest paid and it's, it's a little, you know, a chunk of our, our piece of pie. Thank you. Uh, this is Umer, this is Umer. Umer. can I add a, a comment? Yes, please. Um, so I want to, you know, uh, reiterate what uh, Linda just said and what Susan said initially. Um, you know, as a public library, we are not in the business, you know, our job is to serve the community. And frankly, the people who work for the public library are, uh, are members of the community, whether or not they live within the district. I, I mean, frankly, that's irrelevant to me. Um, you know, we should do everything in our power. I would rather see us cut back on certain services temporarily if necessary so that we can keep people employed. I mean, we, you know, a lot of people are going through a hard time during the pandemic and we should try to be part of that solution rather than part of the problem. From a, from a purely fiscal perspective, my understanding of the, the numbers are that the number that the money that is being used to pay the employees so that they don't have to be furloughed is money that's already been allocated. It's not as if residents are going to be taxed more because we decided not to furlough somebody, et cetera. That's money that's already allocated previously. It's already part of the budget. And by the time it's reallocated the next time, uh, hopefully, you know, with the good news of the vaccines, uh, results coming out, this will no longer be an issue. So rather than make the lives of the people who are doing the hard work um, uh, of the library um, or, and going to be doing the hard work of the library, uh, you know, once it reopens, rather than make their lives difficult, I think we, we owe it to the community as a whole to try to keep people employed. So I'm, I'm very much in, strongly in favor of, of uh, continuing to pay the employees um, if we have to cut back, I'd rather cut back somewhere else. Okay, thank you, Amir. Uh, Linda, I saw you had your hand up again. 
But yes, you're I just did okay. want to make one more point. Susan had sent out some statistical data to us, and I believe it um, wasn't in our packet. But I did take a screen sh screenshot on my phone just because I was like, oh, this is awesome. Um, and wait, let me see. I don't know if you can really sh <laughs> share it, but you can at least maybe see the yellow and the blue. Can you see at least the yellow and the blue? What, just why don't you tell us what we're looking at? Yeah, I yeah. will. I just noticed that the lines are almost the same. And what it is, is it's a circulation comparison of 2019 and 20. And if you can see, the lines are almost the same. And it's the streaming, the e-content, the AV, and the print. And honestly, we're still, our services are still high. It's just that our patron attendance is low, obviously. But the services are still meeting the same that we had in 2019. And I think that's really an important aspect for the community to know our services are not going down. It's just that we can't get into the building because of this darn COVID. So Becky. thank you. Oh, sorry. Yeah, I wanted to note also on that same page that Linda's talking about, I think some of the services were more. I think a lot of the e-services are higher than they were last year. And that makes a lot of sense. Um, and, and also to point out that the year is not yet over. And I think that we are going to see, you know, some other areas catching up to what they were last year. And also to thank you, Susan, for putting that all together. I know you were asked to do that and we kind of didn't didn't happen to go over it yet at the meeting. So I appreciate those charts and things. They were helpful. Yeah. yeah. Um, let's see, I think Diane and then Carol and I'll get to you. Diane, uh, yeah, okay. Yes, um, I think uh, Susan, you've done a wonderful job. And if we look back at the beginning of all of this, you did an astounding job just uh, in planning so that things worked out. We have learned a lot since the beginning of uh, the COVID experience. And it is because of what we've learned that we will continue to improve and honest to gosh, I talked to other people who go to different libraries in our area and they are not satisfied, but our library is one of the top. I totally support all the thought and consideration you have put into uh, opening and keeping our library available to the community. Thank you. Okay, uh, Carolyn, Carolyn. Yeah, I had a couple questions. Um, you know what, uh, Susan, you sent us a um, an email and you talked about you know, the current cases are increasing and it looks like we would not have patrons coming in the library. And you and some of the statistics you sent us indicated, I think, is it unincorporated displays was, I don't know, 11% or 13%, it's really high. And then you mentioned that it was decided that we should continue allowing um, computer use and making copies. And, and I understand some people really need a computer, but with these cases being so high, whether you're coming in to grab a book or you're coming in to make a copy, aren't we putting our staff at risk? I, I have a concern about that, yes. Um, but at the same time, what we've done is we, we've reduced it way, way down. So they have basically four okay. computers going and maybe one person at a copy machine. But I, 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 if, I, if my staff starts to say they are really feeling unsafe, they, oh, they also are shielded <laughs> off in plexiglass and they're not supposed sure. to be coming out from behind the desk. They're okay. so... You know, hopefully they are not doing that. I think some of them are a little bit softies and try to help too much, but I think they all understand that it, that's really okay. the behavior now. But I think- well, I just thought, okay, I just, yeah. I'm thinking we're trying to protect them and then we're like letting these few kind of squeak by. Um, and you know what, I, I do want to make a point. Um, there definitely is a major difference between this year's service and last year's. And I think as a board, I would have expected us to look at some things we could cut. Of course, we don't want our staff out of work. We want them to have benefits. But if we could just figure out other things we could curtail or decrease, it would show 
our community who is out of work, can't make their mortgage or rent payments, who are like increasing food lines, like you wouldn't believe that we are trying to kind of work with the same life they're having to deal with. Sometimes when you look at the library, you would think we are totally untouched because we have not taken a step back to make any changes in our methods of spending. We do exactly this year what we did last year. I'm just saying that doesn't that doesn't make us look like we are the stewards of the money and we care about our residents. But I am concerned that I also don't want to see our staff joining the numbers of unemployed or not being able to take care of their family when it comes to medical needs. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, Linda and Patty, I do see your hands up, but I'm going to call on myself for just a minute here just to uh, respond to a couple of things that Carolyn said. And one is regarding allowing people come in to use the computers. And I will say that I encourage Susan to allow people to make appointments to come in and use the computers and copiers if they need to. I, I just am very concerned that there are some members of our community who do not have a computer at home or doesn't or don't have one that works well or they don't have Wi-Fi. And I, you know, I just think I try and imagine myself, what would my life be like during this pandemic if I didn't have a laptop? I, you know, right now I spend about 10 hours a day looking at my laptop, just doing personal work and working and doing things like that. I can't imagine what life would be like during a pandemic without access, at least occasionally, to a computer and Wi-Fi. And that's what sure. I think our library gives some people. I mean, it's a real lifeline for them. So yes. I, 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 and I, you know, Susan, I just want to say, the last thing I want to do is put our staff at, at uh, risk. And I think you know, and I, I hope your whole staff knows how much the board val values each and every one of them. But we also, we also feel a real duty to our community too. Um, and we appreciate them you know, coming to work and, and taking the risks they do to serve our community. And I appreciate everything you do to try and make the staff safe while they are doing their jobs. Um, I had one other uh, comment I wanted to make regarding um, possibly laying off people. And I realized that that may seem like a good way to save money, but um, actually, Greg, I might ask you if you could jump in here. When we lay people off, uh, we do, of course, have to pay unemployment, correct? Yeah, you just have to unmute yourself there. Um, yeah, so... It's paid uh, by the state, but it affects us, too, ultimately, doesn't right. it? Is that correct? Right. Um, and, you know, to the point, um, we chose a number of years ago, uh, before I, you know, before I came on the scene, uh, the library chose to... Uh, pursue payment of unemployment insurance uh, kind of on a pay-as-you-go basis. So right now it's pretty low uh, because we don't fire a lot of people. And, um, you know, when, uh, when you don't fire a lot of people and your experience rate is good, your uh, unemployment tax is lower. We would, uh, if we had everybody go on unemployment at some point, we would have to pay for that. In terms of the rate of unemployment insurance correct. we pay, is that correct? Yeah, correct. Right. So, in other words, in other words, the state sees an employer who lays off a lot of people as sort of a high-risk employer. That is, that employer appears to be likely to fire people, which incurs expenses for the state. So, the state right. turns around and says, "Okay, you get a high rate," um, and that's that's one thing that we might experience uh, if we did lay off people. Is that correct? Yeah, it's it's not actuarially actuarially uh, determined. It's more like uh, an exact accounting. So if somebody went on unemployment and was paid, let's say, over the course of 26 weeks, ten thousand dollars or something like that, um, what the uh, what the state would do is look to us to pay ten thousand dollars to oh. them. And, you know, I, I believe it's over a three-year peri period or something like that. So, you know, it, it would be a higher rate for three years until all of this experience started to work its way out of the system. Ah, oh, I see. Okay. So I don't know if I realized there was two different ways of signing up with the state of Illinois for 
paying unemployment or mm -hmm. for okay. Yeah. All right. The other the other way is is sort of more actuarially determined. So you I would think pay, that's what I was thinking of. Yeah. Okay. You would you would pay a higher rate even though you know your experience was pretty low. Uh, okay. We chose to you know pin our rate basically to our experience. All right. Okay. So, um, Patty, you had your hand up. It's okay. okay. Passing now. Linda, did you have your hand up? Yes, I just want to respond to Carolyn's statement that the board and the administration is doing business as usual during this COVID time. Um, because I would like um, the whole board um, that were, was here and also that was present, um, that if we remember back at the budget meeting, uh, Susan had done a whole presentation of many light items that she had reduced um, but then, of course, we had to um, add lines for COVID. So we are not doing business as usual. We are doing our due diligence, and we have a director that is very responsive and equitable to our community. So I completely disagree with what Carolyn just stated. Thank you very much. Okay. All right. Carolyn? Yeah. Um not to make this an argument, but if you would look at the levy presentation for 2020 and look at the levy presentation for 2019, the difference in what we spend in a year was only a $50,000 decrease. In the middle of a pandemic, and those are spending patterns. So to even ascertain that in the middle of a pandemic, our overall decrease is maybe 50 grand. That's problematic. So that's what you really need to look at. This has nothing to do with the budget. That was just a, a bunch of line items with a cost associated with them. I'm trying to say there's a major difference between this year and last year. And those are the numbers I'm using. Patty? I understand what you're saying, Carolyn. However, there's also a lot of new expenses that have occurred to the library because of the COVID situation. They have to close down every 45 minutes for cleaning. There's a different stuff they have to buy to keep the place clean and set up. Different ways they have to do things as far as uh, shelving and everything that add up monetarily. So to say it's business as usual, it's not accurate in my opinion. Thank you. Okay. All right. Um, yeah. One, yeah, Linda. I'm sorry. I forgot no, one No, no, that's all right. No. Um, about the printing, I had heard that another library, and I'm not sure how many, had actually done drive-by printing. Yeah, we're, we're trying to figure out a way that we'll be able to do that because... Um, it, it, because, I, I, yeah, I think there is some way. It's just that we probably would have to waive the printing fees to do it. But, yeah, that, that it's that right. kind of a drop and in the bucket. And, right. And, I heard they had given so many prints for free. And I just, you know, yeah, was, looking at you that. were looking at that. But yeah, thank you. Anyway, that's my yeah. last comment. Thank you very much. So, um, Susan, if you can remind us. So, right now, people make appointments to go in to use the uh, computers and so forth. As far as picking up books, do you let people go in and pick them up or do they bring them out to the curb? How are they doing that? Uh, we actually um, use the vestibule so that they um, they put something on hold then they're notified that their hold is available and they make an appointment to come in and get the hold. So then the, it's bagged up, checked out to them already, and they just can come pick up. A, it's a paper bag that's got their stuff in it. So yeah, after we get a lot of compliments time. about how smoothly it's working. So it seems to be going okay. It, it's it's a lot of handling on our end, but um, but it seems to be working well. All right. So do people get a phone number to call when they get an email saying yeah. a book is in? Yeah, and we're okay. also looking into an online way of doing that uh, so that people that don't like making phone calls to cut back on phone tag and things like that. So we're looking into that, but that's where we are right now is just using the phone. Okay. All right. All right, so that um, that discussion took a little while, but it is a, of interest to everyone, and it is something we 
uh, we are very concerned about. So um, I think it's time to move on to the next uh, item. We don't actually have a motion on there. That was just a discussion. But the next item is a motion. And that is, uh, I'm asking for a motion to approve resolution 20-03 for the board to give its vote in the 2020 IMRF executive trustee election for a five-year term of office to Gwen Henry. Uh, can I have a motion to uh, authorize the vote for Gwen Henry? Uh, Patty is a moment. Do I have a second? Diane is a second. So it's open for discussion. Uh, Susan, who is Gwen Henry and, and why, <laughs> why should we vote for her? Uh, I, mean, <laughs> you know, I asked Greg his opinion. Obviously, this is a financial thing. And he <laughs> looked at the three <laughs> candidates. I did too. And we basically, one of them has been a trustee for 12 years, it sounded like, has been the president. Um, she's a CPA, CPFIM. I don't know what that means, and a CPFA. And, uh, and so Greg suggested her, and I thought that looked good. Um, so, but, you know, you've got the information about the candidates. So if you would like to choose a different one that we have no stake in it, we don't know any of the candidates. Okay. All right. Um, okay. Anyone else have any comments or uh, thoughts about uh, voting for uh, a uh, trustee of the IMRF? All right, it's an important position, but I don't know that any of us are in any better position to uh, choose who is the best person. So um, I think that uh, unless there's any other comments, we should just uh, move for a vote. Diane? Uh, Karen? Yes. Carolyn? Yeah. Becky? Yes. Diane? You're muted. I read her lips. Okay. <laughs> Mayor. Yes. Thank you. Uh, Patty. Yes. And Linda. Yes. Okay. All right. Um, thank you very much. Uh, we're now just about the end of our uh, meeting under the other section. One other thing I wanted to bring up before I forgot is um, a question as to whether or not we wanted to have a special board meeting to discuss options for the roof, or if we should just fold that into another uh, board meeting agenda. And uh, perhaps I can ask uh, Susan or Greg how long you think such a discussion might take so we can guess as to whether or not it would be a good idea to have a separate meeting. Uh, so I have um, I have a preliminary report from uh, uh, from BEC, uh, our roofing consultant. And um, what I had expected initially was something that was uh, pretty cut and dried that said this is uh, this is the condition and this is what you should do. And instead what uh, what I got back was uh, a preliminary preliminary report with uh, three different options. I think it's going to take a little bit of time to go through and to talk about. Uh, complicating uh, complicating the issue is uh, some of the work that we've done with um, uh, solar consultants, looking for a solar consultant. Um, you know, all of whom will have different approaches and all of whom will, you know, have different credentials that the board ought to consider. Um, in, in terms of uh, whether or not they want to add solar. If you add solar to our roof, then what happens is, you know, we eliminate at least one of the choices um, that uh, BEC is making, uh, recommendations that BEC is making, because if we, choose that rep if we choose that recommendation, there's just no way that you can do solar on top of that. Rip. Uh, I have to rip to be digital, you know? <laughs> Mr. Uh, can you mute Mr. Yesel? I think we're getting some extraneous no. sound here. So, um, you know, I, I think um, I think the board would be best served to have a separate uh, meeting or meetings to talk to solar consultants and to talk to uh, talk through the BEC uh, recommendations. 
So, okay, so you would envision I was having them as guests here at our, our meeting. Uh, yes. Okay. Yes. All right. Um, before we uh, choose a date, I just want to throw that out to whether or not people think that's a good idea to do that. Patty? Well, my, what I'm thinking is since there's three different suggestions from this company, should we just have a, a, a short meeting to dis hear what they are and discuss the alternatives, you know, what they are? And then decide if at that point, if we want to still hear from somebody with solar, because we might decide after hearing the three things that we're not interested in the solar. I don't know. What do other people think? Um, not, not really hearing one way or the other. Um, how many solar uh, proposals are there? Uh, we have three. Three of them, oh, okay. Um, and BEC has given us three options and two of those three options would allow solar, but one would not, is that correct? Correct. Okay. Um, Carolyn? What, um, what's your timeline? It's uh, end of November, next month is December. What are we trying to accomplish here? I'm, well, I'm not ideally, sure. do you think they're going to be working on the roof if you make a decision in the next two months? You have to get on the list. I know, but I mean, on the list for what? Spring? Yeah. I mean, I, and it's and it's the holidays. I mean, I don't know what we're what we want to try to do here, but I understand. I understand Patty's point. You know, maybe we should um, listen to DEC and then determine where we're going. Um, but I don't know how long what we're talking about here, an extra day or a board, one board meeting left, we could put somebody there. I mean, I don't, I don't know what you're trying to, I just don't think it's the time to be doing it. And then it's a horrible holiday season to try to fit one more meeting in, but whatever you guys come up with. In my opinion with COVID, how much of a holiday season? I, I'm, not, right. I'm not going to I any mean, parties I'm not this year. Any parties, are you? <laughs> no. That's a good point. <laughs> I'm not going anywhere. Good point. Um, no hot dates either. What can I tell you? <laughs> well, um, I, I would sort of like to hear from them and. Um, I'd, I'd, I'd certainly like to hear from them all and have one meeting, but you know, I don't, I don't know how other people feel about scheduling another meeting. I'm not, uh, Is it BEC that's going to talk about their three proposals? Well, I think that's the first person we would hear from. Okay. And, and then the, the solar options after that. Three different people? With the solar, is well, that it? That's right. that's what we have apparently. I mean, we could tell them to be short, like no more than fifteen minutes each, something like that. <laughs> BEC, maybe we could give them, you know, a half hour, and the other three fifteen minutes, something like that. Yeah, but realistically, Karen, we say a half an hour. But they bring up their their three choices and explain them and then, excuse me, we're going to have questions. So it's probably going to last more than a half an hour. Well, well I mean, I, I would suggest, if you don't mind, that you schedule a meeting, um, talk to BEC and hear their three things, ask all of your questions about that. Then talk to the three solar people, kind of get an idea of what they are offering. And then I would suggest sitting on it and voting on it at the following meeting so that you have a chance to kind of ruminate a little bit and decide for yourself, you know, it, it, what where you want to go with it. Um, I, I think it's still definitely like an hour and a half meeting, but you yeah. can have Wednesdays here in December if you wanted to do the second or the ninth. We could see if that works for them. Okay. Um, 
the 25th of November, I don't think we want to do. Uh, no. Did I see someone's hand up? Did I? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I, yeah. I just had. A, I, I just didn't understand, Susan. So you're saying all of this will take an hour and a half? Uh, that's what I'm. I'm hoping that we could. Okay. Do no. 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 Me. Well, here's my <laughs> point. What does our What does our December agenda look like? Is it going to be a long meeting? I uh, no. Do I don't really have much on it. Yeah. So we just do this then, or? Well, then it really late? would be a long meeting. Oh, really? Yeah, but okay. that's up to you guys. I mean, if you want to do it that way, that's fine. Well, no, I thought we didn't have, if the meeting was short, and this short. would be the focus as opposed to a longer meeting. I didn't want to really have everybody stay longer. Yeah. Personally, I'd rather have two short meetings than one huge, where we're well after 10 o'clock. Okay, sure, I agree, I agree. Okay. I mean, if you guys read the report, it's really fairly extensive. And if you read it in advance, you would come to it knowing a, a good deal of information. Okay. Take as long that, as that, that would allow us to All then right. vote on it at the meeting too, right? Sure. Yeah, whatever meeting. you guys want to do. Um, can I throw out the 9th uh, as a possibility, December 9th, which is a Wednesday? Is that uh, a date that would be possible? that okay? I have yeah. no light, so fight with me. <laughs> <laughs> All right, 7 p.m. on December 9th, and that'll be a meeting to hear from everyone that you mentioned, Greg. Can you uh, arrange with them to uh, be available on Zoom that evening? Absolutely. Okay. All right. Okay. Um, thank you very much. So as I mentioned, we're in the other section and I wanted to take care of that before I forgot that. But do we have any other meetings or any other matters that we need to address during the other section of our meeting? Okay, not hearing or seeing any. Um, all right, I'm looking at uh, Big Ben behind Patty, uh, <laughs> which now tells me it's almost 9.30. So, um, I think we've concluded for this evening. Do I have a motion to adjourn? I think Diane uh, had her hand up uh, right away. Uh, and Patty Second. seconder. All right. Um, we have a roll call on our motion to adjourn. Erin? Yes. Carolyn? Yes. Becky? Yes. Diane? Yes. Umar? Yes. Patty? Yes. Linda? Yes. All right. Um, so uh, happy Thanksgiving, everyone. Um, oh, happy we Thanksgiving will to you. Happy Thanksgiving. You, uh, at the next uh, meeting in uh, December. December 9th. And, um, you know, uh, I, Susan, I think I need to talk to you also. Um, uh, perhaps I can call you quickly after the meeting. OK? okay. That's All right. Thank you very okay. much. Thank you. Bye. 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 Happy Enjoy your holiday. Happy Thanksgiving. Right. Thanksgiving. Aaron and Diane, I'll be calling you tomorrow. Okay. Right. Fine. Thank you.